right, welcome back to Theater Online for Austin P. State University. Today we're going to talk a little bit about theater and cultural diversity. A big part of what theater is, is it is for the common man. Now here we have an image um, from Rent, which is a very recognizable musical some of you may have heard of from the 90s. Um, it is a great example of how someone can get their message out and say something kind of daring. Uh, you have to remember in the 90s, AIDS was a very silent issue. Um, politicians weren't talking about AIDS. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan famously didn't even say AIDS. Um, and here comes this musical that's all about people dying from AIDS, homosexuals, as well as heterosexuals and their battle against AIDS. And um, it was a mouthpiece for a generation. It was an anthem for um, Greenwich Village and what that stood for, that lifestyle stood for. Um, in the recovery of a lot of drug addiction and um, a lot of the uh, choices that people were making in the 90s. Um, and uh, I always have to just say, if you've never actually seen Rent live, you've only watched the movie, uh, I always think it's a bad choice with musicals to have these power rock ballads captured in an itty bitty video. Um, you know, it's much more moving and powerful live than it is on video. Some of you may enjoy the video, you know, congratulations to you, but I thought it was a horrible, it was a... I won't say horrible, but it wasn't as powerful as maybe seeing it in the theater. Once again, that is Rent by Jason Larson. So there is the point here it, on our very first page, on page... I don't have the corner. Um, I guess it would be 51, about how theater is free. Uh, you know, theater storytelling. It's one person getting and broadcasting their voice. And so... It has in many times and in many places been a mouthpiece for someone who couldn't afford a big advertisement or a billboard or, you know, a newspaper article. Here I have a video uh, image from Amiri Baraka's uh, very famous movie. Um, but before it became a movie, it was something that... Um, supporters of Malcolm X would stage these happenings on subways, on street corners, in Harlem to get the message out. Um, you know, we, as part of the civil rights movement, uh, don't have to just practice peaceful protest. In this case, uh, we can um, practice violent protest. We're not going to take it anymore. And this was Amiri Baraka's way of kind of rallying the troops. And so he wrote this play specifically to be staged on a subway. And you can imagine sitting on a subway wondering, uh, what is this big spectacle that this white woman and this black man are making, um, not knowing that it's a play until um, the play is over. So uh, it can be a, a voice for the a disenfranchised. Um, if you haven't already, I've attached an August Wilson video to this um, unit. If you'll go away before you watch this and <laughs> watch that August Wilson biography and a little bit about who he is as a disenfranchised person, I feel as a white person, I can't really do this chapter the justice that August Wilson can. So I'm leaving it into his powerful voice. August Wilson is one of the most uh, produced artists in this day, which is, there's a lot to say for that. Lots of theaters are doing August Wilson's work. And definitely one of the most celebrated, one of the most uh, awarded, you know, Pulitzer, Drama's Desk, all of those awards have gone ten times over to August Wilson. Unfortunately, we lost him, oh, 2006, I think. Um, but uh, August Wilson is a major part of... Um, cultural diversity in theater and one of and the major voices to represent what that means so um just wanted to say that before I go any farther if you haven't gone ahead and watched that August and Wilson video and just to be clear uh the testable material includes the clips the things that are outside of the lecture so don't be surprised uh when you see questions from the August Wilson video on the test so uh for this unit 
So, um, sorry, back to Amiri Baraka. Uh, y you know, this was not just in the 1960s uh, and not just in America. All over the world, theater has been a voice piece for the disenfranchised. Um, perhaps the largest uh, sort of disenfranchised group throughout theater history has been women. Uh, to the left here we have an image of the Trojan Women, which is a very uh, famous play, uh, but it would have been portrayed by men, uh, men wearing masks, because uh, the stage, well, work in general was something that most women didn't do, especially in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, women belonged in the home, very rarely went outside of their home, except for big festivals. Um, but even up into Shakespeare's day, many of you know, um, still know women on stage in England, uh, in Italy, in the Commedia dell'arte, we had these family performances and women were starting to get on the stage then, but um, very rarely. Um, you know, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet would have been portrayed by a little boy, a teenage boy who had a still a high voice uh, and could portray a woman. Um, not only in the West, in the East, um, men portrayed women on stage. Women created kabuki, but then the magistrate at the time, they, they took it away from the women and decided that it was too close to prostitution to be on the stage. Uh, women were arrested, as they talk about in your book, for being involved in theater um, because it was too close to prostitution. So... Um, the big question there is, well, what effect does the absence of women in theater have on the plays that were written? Um, obviously, there weren't a whole lot of theater uh, playwrights that were women uh, up until the turn of the century. And even then, um, you know, few and far between. Even today, I think they said one in five playwrights is a woman. So we're really uh, missing that woman perspective. And so you have to ask yourself, how did men tell the story of women? Um, perhaps the most controversial uh, of these is the picture I have here. In China, uh, women used to bind their feet. If you ever want to gross yourself out on a Tuesday afternoon, go and Google uh, binding women's feet. Uh, it was a torturous practice because small feet were considered attractive in China. And so the women would bind their feet to be smaller, um, physically disfigure themselves. And uh, before you judge too harshly, how many of you wear heels, high heels? Um, you know, it's, it's not exactly good for your feet. Um, but we do a lot in the sake of, for the sake of beauty which we talked about in the first class, um, beauty being important. But um, the reason I bring up the binding of feet is it affected the way that women walked uh, because their feet were bound. They took shorter, smaller steps. And in the traditional Beijing opera, when women were actually introduced into the theater after um, the, the Beijing opera was revitalized after the communist government um, kind of unleashed it back into the people, uh, men were teaching women how to walk. Can you imagine, as a woman, being taught by a man how you walk? <laughs> um, and I kind of use that analogy just to kind of highlight, a man really can never know what it's like to be a woman. Um, you know, Shakespeare wrote some great female roles. I'd love to play Portia in my lifetime. I think Lady Macbeth is a particularly compelling female role, and I have my Lady Macbeth moments. I understand where she's coming from. I mean, you know, but then he also has plays like Taming of the Shrew, where a woman is basically beat into submission. Um, and these perpetuated stereotypes that we see of women on stage in historical uh, theater, they're not always fun to play. A lot of the women in historical drama are... Uh, you know, flighty and, oh no, I broke a nail kind of personalities. I mean, that's not a direct quote from uh, Agamemnon or anything, but, you know, <laughs> a lot of the women were either villainized, uh, you know, they were either the Madonna or the whore. There wasn't a lot of in-between. And you have to think that's not only in theater, that's in, you know, books and um, novels and poetry. Uh, you know, how do men represent women and how does that affect a perpetuation of oh, what 
uh, womanhood is. So it'll be interesting to see, hopefully, in a hundred years, when all of these women writers, when there are as many women writers and men writers, uh, how women are portrayed and how people see women as a result of how we portray ourselves. So if you're a woman out there, go write a play. It's important. Um, I think it's also interesting what they talk about on page 55 of women in power as executives. This is a big call in the African-American community, too. I'm surprised he doesn't mention it. Um, more uh, black producers putting out, um, you know, black movies and black plays um, until the money is kind of spread into different um, people's hands. As long as, as long as it's only, you know, white men holding the purse strings, we're really not going to have a lot of uh, diverse entertainment out there, unfortunately. Um so, just something to think about. Um, if you are a woman, how would you feel seeing a portrayal of you as written by a man? Um, you know, would they be dismissive or disingenuous in some way? Because they don't fully understand what it is to be you. Which is part of the reason I gave you this August Wilson supplement. Because it would be just as um, hypocritical for me to say, pretend like I understand what it's like to be a person of color in America. Um, so what's the solution to this? One of the solutions that I think is very powerful and working in theater and film is casting against type. This is The Tempest, which is a play by William Shakespeare. And Prospero is the main character, and he is dying. He's on this island. Uh, it's Shakespeare's last play. It's very magical, but it's also very much about mortality. And um, Julie Taymor, who is the very famous director. She directed for the stage quite a bit. Lion King, uh, the famous Broadway Lion King, and then um, Spider-Man Turned Off the Dark was her brainchild as well. But um, this is actually a film where she casts Helen Mirren in a traditionally male part of uh, Prospero. And it's a, it's a very coveted part. It's sort of a older, wise character um, who's uh, a wizard, basically. So, um, but I think that it's great when I see historical plays acted out by women. This is very uh, common device nowadays. You know, all female Hamlet, uh, just giving women more opportunities in historical drama. Because, uh, you know, another example is uh, Twelve Angry Jurors. You know, when that play was written in the '60s, uh, you know, men were the breadwinners, and so of course it's going to write. 12 men roles because men were the ones who were auditioning for the majority of the people out there uh, auditioning for jobs and so now we often see a 12 angry jurors uh, performed by high schools that's a hard word to say jurors uh, but 12 angry jurors instead of 12 angry men because they want to be able to cast women so um, uh, you know we recently had community high school uh, in Unionville, Tennessee, put on 12 Angry Jurors, and I was very glad to see it, to give give women a chance in these big roles. But, um, you know, a lot of uh, writers are known for being uh, good writers for women, um, as opposed to others who are, you know, still predominantly male. Um, it's a, something to ask yourself when you're reading a play, is this a good role for a woman, um, or is this still kind of pandering to a male dominated base so something I personally struggled with as a primarily classical actress um, so theater of identity this is a uh, form of cultural uh, theater where we kind of just celebrate what it means to be part of a culture and if you're not familiar this is the whiz yes that's little Michael Jackson on the far right with his orange and white sleeves there Diana Ross um, the Wiz is a retelling of The Wizard of Oz, and The Wizard of Oz is the great American folk tale. Um, and it's uh, something that in the 1970s, African Americans took the story and made it their own. You know, we are part of America, and this is the way that we want to tell this story. Um, and uh, it celebrates uh, 1970s black culture. It uh, is very stylized. A lot of the dance moves and the singing styles uh, celebrate at what it was like to be black in the 70s. So um, it's a good example of theater of identity. And uh, when I 
had the opportunity, I taught high school for uh, three years, and I worked at an inner city school, which was primarily African American, and we put on a version of The Wiz, and people come out from um, young to old to celebrate The Wiz, and it really does feel like a time for um, people of color to sit back and, and kind of just bask in um, enjoying the fun culture that, that goes along with The Wiz. Um, just to clarify, theater of identity, if you haven't read in your book on page uh, 55, I have 56 here because it moves over to that, but the definition is, um, once again, just inviting members of a culture to experience the joys and traditions of that culture. So, um, moving on to uh, page 58, they talk just a little bit about minstrel shows. Now why do I have a picture of Tyler Perry and Spike Lee? Uh, minstrel shows uh, were these 19th century's inventions in vaudeville. Once we talked about this a little bit last class where white people would put on blackface. Um, Spike Lee came very vocal against uh, Tyler Perry in saying that the kind of theater that uh, Tyler Perry puts on, the kind of movies that he puts on are minstrelsy and saying that it's all just um, bamboozling and uh, you know this sort of broad humor perpetuating stereotypes. Um, <laughs> Tyler Perry came back and said, yeah, Spike Lee can kiss my black ass, <laughs> very famously uh, retorted there. And I basically, I think it's more of a difference of um, culture. I think that Spike Lee is very much a product of intelligent New York, uh, sophisticated, um, thoughtful, you know, uh, sort of highbrow culture, whereas Tyler Perry is closer to my own culture, which is Southern and uh, uh, just a very Southern, uh, you know, hearty laugh, a very different kind of culture than what Spike Lee is presenting. I don't think that it's necessarily um, bamboozling or minstrelsy, but um, just know that some um, African Americans are still kind of looking for the signs of minstrel shows and sort of accusatory. That would be a negative uh, thing. Cat Williams, um, you know, has also been accused of minstrelsy. And once again, he's he's from Atlanta, so uh, we kind of see this Southern um, culture is sometimes a- accused of having some of these holdovers from from the minstrel shows. Um, so as we look at, uh, the history of cultural diversity in theater of identity, um, the Harlem Renaissance is really hard to overstate how important it was in the 1920s that jazz and Langston Hughes came out and were proud to be African American and were proud to create their own art and, um, Langston Hughes had a profound effect on Lorraine Hansberry, who then created the first successful Broadway show with um, an all-black cast, and that is Raisin in the Sun. Raisin in the Sun was a breakout on Broadway. It sold out. Of course, it was all white people coming to see it. Um, some some African Americans were able to come, but uh, a lot of it was sort of... And, and, the, and African Americans who did come. I watched a documentary once about it and how proud they were to see uh, this story that portrayed uh, African Americans in such a positive light and it was really a source of pride for them to go to the Broadway show and um, sort of celebrate uh, their culture. Um, Raisin in the Sun was recently, I've got the video, the picture here from the movie version, which was put out. Of course, you see Felicia Rashad there in the middle, uh, Miss Cosby, uh, and uh, Sean Combs, P. Diddy, uh, for those of you uh, who know him by that. Well, I'm not really sure what his, I think he's just Diddy now. Is that wrong? I don't know. Uh, you know, some people said that uh, he was a horrible actor. I, I really enjoyed him in the role. I thought he was typecast. He didn't have to reach far outside of himself. He's no Sidney Poitier, but, you know, I don't think there's anybody who's Sidney Poitier. He's originated the role. If you've never seen the old Raisin in the Sun, um, the black and white one, really 
a fantastic role. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, this Raisin in the Sun is one of the most important plays we have of this century, I think. Um, and it is a very emotional play. It's sometimes satirized uh, for its emotion. And it is about a family who move out of a black uh, apartment building that's overcrowded and into a white neighborhood. And then um, a committee comes to them in the white neighborhood and says, um, you know, we'll give you money if you leave. And they say, no, we're going to we're going to stay here and make it work. And Walter Lee, the, the part played by P. Diddy, tragically loses a lot of insurance money in a... Ponzi scheme uh, to open a liquor store. So that's just a small glimpse into Raisin in the Sun. Um, if you've never checked it out, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful story. All right, so we talked just a little bit about women being disenfranchised from the stage uh, in classical theater. Um, but it's also important to note that it still happens sometimes for African Americans as well on the screen. Um, an example, you know, of pay it forward. Um, the novel on which this movie is based was originally written with a strong black male lead. Um, he, his reason for being embarrassed to go out into public is because he had keloids. Um, you may not be familiar with this, uh, term. It's, a uh, skin growth that, um, is specific to African Americans, uh, but they actually rewrote the scripts just so that they could have a, a white man in the lead. And I see these sort of gross, just, I'm not really even sure why they did that. Uh, you know, I'm, I read an article about it and it really bothered me, um, why they wouldn't give a person of color that role. There's talk about it a little bit in your book, just some of the, uh, same, issues that they had on page 58 they talk about the Asian actors uh, and their portrayal of uh, Miss Saigon and how a white man was cast in that role and the Asian actors protested and rightly so. Another thing to ask yourself as you're evaluating authors and as you're reading are we writing in these roles for people of color? Um, it's an important important thing to do if we're telling American stories to include all of the um, colors of America. Um, a really important playwright right now is Susan Laurie Parks. Um, she uh, has a really fresh style, very much part of the hip-hop culture. Uh, her play, um, Top Dog, Underdog, which you can see a picture of on page 60, uh, is is a really uh, fresh and funny. Uh, if you're offended by language, I wouldn't recommend it though. It's very, uh, very a lot of cuss words in it. But um, you know these two brothers, Lincoln and Booth. Uh, one is a Lincoln impersonator. It's really quirky stuff. Another really fun work that she has is 365 plays, 365 days. Uh, that is uh, the cover of it right there. She sat down every day for a year and wrote a play, wrote a short play. And they're rhythmic. Uh, they're uh, fresh. They have a quirky sense of humor. Um, I did a scene, um, Miss Keckley and Miss Lincoln. And if you're not familiar, um, Miss Lincoln had a dressmaker. She had a slave. And so it kind of is just a scene between Miss Lincoln and her dressmaker kind of exploring, you know, oh, well, you are the emancipator, the great emancipator, and yet you have, you know, this dressmaker and what it must have been like to, to be there in that house. Um, but I'm excited to see what else Susan Lloyd Parks is uh, going to do. She's, of course, written on some movies here lately, uh, but I hope she's going to go back and write some really fresh plays for us. Um, and of course, August Wilson, on page 59, they go into uh, who August Wilson is as perhaps the greatest example of um, cultural a theater of identity, uh, because his plays, he specifically writes in many of his um, articles that this is the ground on which I stand is one of his most famous articles about the fact that his plays are for people of color. Uh, they're intended to be cast with people of color and uh, it is uh, supposed to be the untold story of the black man in America. So um, 
that you can read a little bit about fences. It's one of that's the play that I was able to direct when I worked at the inner city school. Uh, powerful, powerful story about a father who won't let his son play ba- baseball because uh, he's afraid that he'll have the same um, kind of glass ceiling his son will have the same glass ceiling experience that the father had and so it's it's about boundaries it's about uh, limitations and uh, it's about change and some people's unwillingness to change Um, Troy Maxson is a garbage collector and uh, you can read more about that Um, I'll get back to August Wilson in just a minute uh, so, uh, oh, well, never mind. I'll talk about it next. I uh, outsmart myself sometimes. Um, so Joe Turner's Come and Gone is a, a play uh, surrounding Harold Loomis. Harold Loomis is the man in the trench coat there. And that's his daughter, Zonia. And they, uh, Harold Loomis was wrongly imprisoned for seven years to work in a camp. Now, the title comes from a blues song. All of August Wilson's uh, plays have a heavy blues influence. And it's it's lost kind of in the translation when it became a blues song. As you know, those were oral tradition and kind of passed down. The actual name of the real person is Joe Turney. Pete Turney was a Tennessee governor. And Joe Turney was his brother. And Joe Turney had a farm. And because his brother was the governor, he could go and just pick up these black men, accuse them of anything he wanted to, take them to a kangaroo court, kind of trump up charges against them, and then um, make them work for seven years. Uh, you know, totally unfair, no justice in the system. So when Harold Loomis gets out of this, he is rightfully so this fictional character he is just very very bitter but you know the what August Wilson wants to do he's writing this whole play to tell you that story about Joe Turney he wants you to know that that's something that they didn't put in your history books but it's true and some of us um, who are younger we kind of take it for granted uh, that we get to hear that story. Well, it's because a lot of you now are learning World Civ, um, but for many years in America, we taught Western Civ. And so it's people like August Wilson who stood up in the 70s and 80s and said, everybody needs to have their story told, not just white men who, who get this a- across. Um, he's very much interested in telling history. And he does what are called cycle plays every 10 years in American history. He tells an African American story. So Fences, the play that I directed, was set in 56 or 57. It was set in the 50s. Whereas Joe Turner's Come and Gone is turn of the century. So um, the goal is to tell 100 years of African American history. Uh, Luis Valdez wrote a very important play, Zoot Suit, also kind of protesting a historical event that happened and the injustice of it. A sailor uh, was killed by a, a supposedly a Latino in a Zoot Suit. And so in this real uh, experience, as we have here in your book on page 61, you can see um, that all of these sailors in Los Angeles got off the boat and just started attacking all of the men, Latino men in zoot suits that they could just find. They they just killed lots and lots of people. Um, I'm sorry, this story is on page 62. Uh, You know, and the horrible injustice of that. And so, you know, writers tell these stories to sort of uh, get the the message out there. Um, This is probably the most popular You've heard of Eve Ensler before and her vagina monologues. Um, These are just stories about vaginas. Um, And it's not all positive. A lot of them are about rape or um, abnormalities, um, African mutilation. I mean, it's a really kind of a heavy stuff. And it's often done by women's studies programs at universities. It gets a lot of press for that as well. Um, You know, even Zler has other uh, books too, sorry, uh, monologue kind of uh, plays as well, if you'd like to look into more of her work. Um, Another one of my favorite female writers of protest is Wendy Wasserstein. 
I feel a need to say that as well. If you're a feminist and you're interested in reading um, some more theater of protest, Wendy Wasserstein writes some interesting stuff. Okay, so the last of our cultural diversity categories here is cross-cultural theater. Um, and uh, this is where we mix more than one culture in an effort to kind of find a commonality. And uh, this is M. Butterfly. Um, you can see John Lithgow in the background, and that is B.P. Wong in the front there. Uh, B.P. Wong is actually a man, and he uh, dresses as a woman, but he has this love affair with his French ambassador, played by John Lithgow, uh, but he doesn't actually know he's a, a man until uh, much later in the story after he's fallen in love with her. Um, but uh, this is David Henry Wang's uh, great sort of fusion. Now, David Henry Wang is an Asian American. He's uh, very American, uh, but he kind of takes some of the Beijing opera. He takes uh, some of the staging techniques um, from the Chinese in order to tell the story, and it's a great way of kind of clearing up some of the confusion around stereotypes in Asia and kind of challenging that idea. Uh, this is one of the more successful cross-cultural experiments. A lot of cross-cultural experiments are coming from people in the East sort of doing plays of the West. So um, in your book, they talk about Tadashi Suzuki and his staging, famous staging of um, the Scottish play, we in theater always kind of hesitate to say Macbeth uh, outright, but um, they, they do these, um, but they still do them in the fashion of the Asian styling of staging. So um, it's a great way to kind of bring out the universality. You know, a lot of the themes in Macbeth about war and bloodthirst and ambition are cross-cultural. They're true um, in the Japan as much as they were in England and as much as they are in America. So when they sort of cross those cultures and tell the story through more than one eye, that's called cross-cultural theater. So all of this can be kind of summed up in just... Uh, asking you to avoid ethnocentrism. It is completely normal, and I hesitate anytime we get into these sort of pluralistic conversations where we're encouraging you to be enlightened and egalitarian, you are still entitled to your culture, and you can't help but see things through your own glasses, your own what we would call worldview in academia. You have your ethnicity, you have your way of being, and, but you one of the goals of education is to kind of get you to start seeing things through other perspectives. It's a common essay assignment some of you may have already experienced. You know, I want you to write this from a feminist perspective, or I want you to write this from the perspective of um, someone who breaks down the language, a deconstructionalist. Um, and it, it's important for you to start seeing things through other people's eyes. This is a picture of Francis Bacon here. Um, I think it was before his emotional breakdown, <laughs> um, but he talks about idols in a cave and saying that when we shelter ourselves, when we seclude ourselves, when we lock ourselves in the closet, um, we're missing out on the complete view, the scope. We're, we're minimizing and we're not seeing all the questions that are out there. Um, I think it's a great example in your book here. And I remember when all this was going on, and I never did hear the whole story, uh, that there was a painting of the Madonna of the Holy Virgin Mary with elephant poop hanging off of it. Um, but this painter who painted the Madonna and hung the elephant poop was actually Nigerian and Roman Catholic, and he elephant poop in Nigeria was a fertilizer. It was a symbol for growth and um, fertility and nurturing and goodness, um, but, but he, in New York they didn't get all that, uh, and, and it was vandalized. Um, so before you close your ears... Before you shut yourself off to another perspective, ask yourself, have I walked a mile in their shoes? Am I seeing it from their perspective? And another important quote for me to give you here, besides Mr. Bacon here, is uh, Aristotle. And he said, is the mark of an intelligent person that you can consider an idea without accepting it. 
right? I'm not saying that you have to agree with all of the lifestyles that are pointed out in these other um, plays, but I want you to at least consider them before you shut them down. I, I'm afraid in our culture that we've come to a place where we stick our fingers in our ears, we're not really listening to each other. So hopefully I've kind of broadened your horizons today. I know August Wilson will. He is a poet, a beautiful poet, uh, one of my favorite playwrights. So hopefully after listening to his interview, you've got a broader view of what theater can be for the minority and culturally diverse audiences. Thank you for listening.